Now, I'm really excited to introduce a scientist whose research is really to relate it to the reason why we're all at home today. Professor Florian Kraber is a renowned virologist studying COVID, which we know this disproportionately impacts black and brown communities. Um, but let me tell you how big a deal he is. Professor Kramer has published more than 200 papers and is one of Forbes' most influential people to follow on Twitter during the COVID-19 outbreak. His coronavirus research has been published and frequently cited. Professor Kramer is a professor of vaccinology and the Department of Microbiology at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and the principal investigator of the Sinai Emory Multi-Institutional Collaborative Influenza Vaccine Innovation Center, <sighs> CIVIC <laughs> for short. So CIVIC aims to develop and improve flu vaccines, including vaccines to protect against future pandemic viruses. Um, Dr. Kramer, the floor is yours. Thanks, Ladasha, for this uh, great introduction. And uh, I hope I'm not the reason why everybody has to uh, stay at home. So it does disable <laughs> participants screen sharing. Uh, I think I need permission to, to share my slides. I think you should be able to just hit the screen share button on the bottom. Yeah, when I do that, it's, oh, now it works. Perfect. Um, it was just me. Okay. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to, to uh, show a little bit of what, what we're doing in the lab here and uh, talk a little bit about uh, SARS coronavirus 2, uh, but I really wanted to start to tell you a little bit about how I ended up in science. Um, and uh, just to show you that uh, it's fun to actually, uh, you know, have a, a scientific career path and, and how to get there. Um, so, as I said a little bit about myself, I'm, I'm not from the US, I'm, I'm from uh, Austria. You might not be familiar, Austria is a very small country in the middle of Europe, uh, not to, uh, not to, um, uh, it's not the same as Australia, which is exactly on the opposite side of the globe. Uh, it's a very small country. It has about the, the population of, uh, of New York City, about 8 million. And I actually grew up in the countryside in a small little village in the mountains. And the village has a population of about 500 people. And so I show you some pictures here of how it looks uh, like there. It's a very boring place. There's lots of, far there's lots of farms, nature, woods, creeks. We have a lot of ponds and a lake there and mountains. But you can see there's really not much. Uh, there's some nice, nice mountains. And this is how you get around in the countryside in Austria. Um, and um, so, I, you know, it's in a way a boring place, but you have a lot of exposure to nature. And I, I got very interested in, in nature early on. Um, and I kind of, you know, started to collect different plants and I, I got familiar with, with all kinds of biology around in the woods. Um, and so um, when I went to high school, I went to actually a specialized high school that had a, a STEM track. And I was always very good in biology and chemistry because that's what I was interested in. I was okay in math, but I actually got pretty bad grades in English and German. German is the language that, uh, uh, that is uh, spoken in, in Austria. And then after I finished high school, I went to university, um, a university in, that's called University of Life Sciences and Natural Resources. And so uh, in many European countries, you have to do a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and then you can go to the PhD. So you can't, you have to do the master's. And so I got a um, bachelor's degree in food science and biotechnology. Initially, food science was interesting for me. I also like to eat. Um, but then I decided that the master's degree is something that's more interesting for me. In, uh, the master's degree in biotechnology is something that's more interesting for me. And I went in that direction. And, then I started to uh, do internships in vaccine companies. Uh, there are a few of them in Austria. And I kind of learned how to produce vaccines. Um, and then I, I did a PhD in virology. And uh, during my PhD, I worked on influenza vaccines, uh, basically learning how to grow the virus, how to inactivate it, and then uh, how to get a good immune response to the virus that can protect you. 
Um, and then in 2010, I decided that I want to do a postdoc. So postdoc is basically what you do after your PhD when you, if you want to stay in academia. So you just go to another lab and you work there for a couple of years. And uh, typically you do that internationally. Uh, and so I went to Mount Sinai to Peter Belize's laboratory here at, uh, at the microbiology department. And so I stayed for three years in Peter's lab. And then uh, in 2013, I became professor, which is kind of the next step after you do postdoc. And I got my own lab in 2014. And as you can see here on the right side, uh, we actually have a lot of fun in the lab. Uh, it's a, a, a very scientific place, but it's also a place where you can have fun. Um, this is my laboratory. Um, so those are all people I work with. Um, some of them are technicians, some of them are students, and some of them are other postdocs. And so what we typically do is we study um, viruses, um, mostly influenza viruses, but now also the SARS coronavirus too. And so just to explain what we, we typically are interested in, uh, I'm interested in to in finding out how our, our body, our immune system can actually kill viruses. And so what typically happens when you get infected, uh, there's this little virus particle here on the left side and that can infect the person, right? So the person gets infected, meaning the virus gets into the body. And then once the virus, this little guy here is in the body, it goes on and looks for your cells. And this is basically a human cell here. Uh, and this is the nucleus of the human cell. Um, and so the virus comes and gets into your cells and basically takes over. Um, and instead of um, the cell being just happy and, and sitting there and doing what it's supposed to do, it starts to make more virus and eventually the cell dies. And there is more virus and then this virus moves on and infects more cells. And that's when you start to be sick. Um, but our body is pretty amazing and it makes some small little uh, molecules that are called antibodies. So these are proteins that are made by specialized cells. And what these antibodies can actually do, uh, they can start to stick to viruses. And when they do that, the virus has no chance to go on and infect the human cells, cell anymore. And so you're protected and these antibodies kill the virus. And that's actually what the majority of the work that my lab is doing uh, is focused on. We try to understand how these little antibodies interact with the virus and kill the virus. And that's also the basis of making vaccines. And so, um, as I said, we, the majority of work that we do is we study viruses and the immune interaction with the immune system. And that includes influenza viruses, uh, so flu, uh, which you know we get infected with very often. We have these flu seasons, but also more dangerous viruses like Lassa virus, which is a virus that is very prevalent in, in West Africa and kills a lot of people. Hunter viruses, you might have heard of those. Uh, we have them in, in, uh, in New Mexico and Arizona, for example. They're also pretty deadly. Zika virus or things like Ebola virus. So uh, we have a lot of these viruses in the laboratory. Uh, we work with the viruses and we work with the immune system to look how, how, this, how the immune system kills the virus. And then we use that information to design vaccines that can protect us. And one of the main projects that we have in the lab is to develop a vaccine uh, against influenza that would protect you against all kinds of flu strains, uh, bird flu, regular flu, and uh, you know that usually you have to take flu shots every year because the virus changes so much. And our idea is to develop a vaccine that you only have to uh, take uh, maybe two or three times in your life and you would be good for life. And we're actually relatively far with that. Uh, we started to test that in, in humans in clinical trials already. Um, but then in, in, in January, SARS coronavirus 2 came around and immediately we started to work on that virus. And um, so that virus has these little uh, um, spikes on the surface that it uses to attach to our cells. And again, you can have these antibodies that then bind to these spikes and that kills the virus. And so we got very interested in looking at that and measuring uh, these antibodies, these proteins that the body makes to stop the virus. And so we designed um, tests um, where we can actually measure that. 
and so a way to do that is to uh, take the gene uh, for this uh, for this spike on the surface of the virus and then clone that and make it in the laboratory without making the virus just making that protein and that's what you can see here these little bands here are actually um, spike protein uh, from SARS coronavirus 2 and then we can measure this spike uh, use these spike proteins to actually measure these antibodies that humans who have been infected make and so uh, the red lines here represent people that have these antibodies and the black lines and the green line here represent people who don't have these antibodies and so we can distinguish and we can figure out who makes antibodies and who doesn't and uh, this became a big deal uh, antibody testing and uh, I had to learn a new skill I'm a very shy person and all of a sudden there was a lot of media attention and people wanted to talk about this uh, and still is a big deal. Uh, there's a lot of uh, outreach that we have to do now as well. Um, and so what are we doing now? Um, we use these tests that we develop to find people who already have, have these little antibodies that can kill the virus. And then we ask people to donate blood. Um, and then this blood or plasma is used to treat people who are severely, severely sick with COVID-19. We can also figure out if somebody was already infected, even if that person wasn't sick, we can find out if that person had the infection already. We can also find out how many people in New York City had already been infected, what percentage, and we can look how long lasting these antibodies are, and we can see how much you need in order to be protected so that you can't get sick again. And so those are things that we are working on right now. And we already have some results. We see that these antibodies, once you have them, they're relatively stable. So we, we looked now in people who got infected three months ago and they still have a lot of these antibodies. And we have confirmed that if you have these antibodies, they can actually kill and neutralize the virus. And that's a very good sign. Uh, we also know that a lot of people who had the infection and now have these little antibodies, um, we monitor these people and nobody get inf got infected a second time at Mount Sinai. So we think that once you had the infection once, you cannot get infected again, which is great. And we also know how many New Yorkers are already, were already infected, and that's about a fifth uh, of all New Yorkers, so about 20%. Uh, that's something that we just found out. And so I, I just wanted to, to finish with, uh, with one slide, which is kind of a little bit trying to predict the future. So all of you have participated in social distancing, and that really had the effect that this first wave of infection that hit the city uh, was very short and the infections were going down pretty quickly. And so just by staying at home, you saved probably a lot of lives. And so New York City is doing really well. But there's other places uh, in Texas and in Florida, for example, where the numbers of infections now go up. So while New York is fine, other places have a lot of circulation of the virus. And we know from other uh, pandemics in the past that usually the virus comes and then goes away and then it comes back two or three times and so we have to be a little bit careful about what happens in fall and in winter because we ha might have another pandem uh, pandemic wave and we might have to have a lockdown again to make sure that uh, people don't die um, but there's a lot of efforts going into making a vaccine and once a vaccine is available the problem is probably uh, um, solved and uh, then we probably can go to back to normal life and so this virus this SARS coronavirus 2 will likely not disappear in the end it probably stays in the population and it's very interesting to know that there's four different viruses that cause common cold in, in humans they're also coronaviruses they are not making us severely sick but you know you might get the sniffles uh, when you get them um, and so these viruses, all four of them, uh, at some point caused the pandemic and were actually introduced uh, to the human population from animals. And so this, this virus is nothing else. Uh, it's basically going the same route. And in the long run, it probably becomes the fifth human coronavirus that might cause some sniffles, but might not cause uh, severe disease anymore. And so um, with that, I'll end my presentation and I'll take any questions if there is time. I think we have a few time for a few questions. Um, raise your hand in the chat. 
Uh, okay, so Chow. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it should be. Um, hello, Florian. First, thank you for the presentation. It's very interesting. My name is Chow. I'm a high school science teacher. So my question is, um, in, if you look at the, the coronavirus data in Australia, which is in the winter now, there, wa there wasn't a uh, surge in the number of coronavirus cases. So do you think that is an indication that the virus is not seasonal? It's hard to say, it's a good observation, but the problem is uh, Brazil and Argentina and Chile have winter now as well, and they are getting hit extremely hard. Um, so we know that the virus probably does better in cold weather, um, but it is not the case that it doesn't transmit at all when it's warm, right? So probably if it would be winter now, it would be harder to control here. Um, and I expect that it will become seasonal uh, once the pandemic is over. And this is also something we see for influenza. If you remember 2009, H1N1, the first wave that hit was uh, basically starting in, in spring and then uh, was circulating till June, July. And then there was a second wave in September. And then the following year it became seasonal and only came back in winter. So this is a pattern that we usually see for these pandemic viruses. Thank you. Um, I, th I saw Yasna's hand up. I don't know, maybe she, maybe she uh, left the, the building. Does anyone else have any questions? Does everybody know how to raise raise their oh, hand? Yeah. I see so, J Justin. Okay. Hi, Dr. Kramer. I'm an undergrad researcher at the University of Arizona. And I wanted to know what type of vaccine do you think shows a great promise for the SARS-CoV-2 in terms of like the platform delivery? Um, I think that a lot of the platforms out there look very, very good. Um, there are inactivated vaccines that have been developed in China that look really good in animal models. Uh, there have been vaccines that are based on viral vectors, adenovirus, um, that look really good. Um, we, the, the data that I've seen from Moderna look good, uh, but also data from, for example, J&J uh, &J look good. So um, I don't think, what I think is that there is going to be a number of vaccine candidates that will work. Um, that's my prediction. I wouldn't single one of them out right now and say that's the best one, uh, but uh, there's a lot of them that show promise. Thank you. Hi, so uh, if you go to the participant button on the bottom, then you can raise your hand on the side. So Yasna. Um, so my question was, um, I have two questions. The first question was, if Corona stays for good, will we still have to keep on social distancing or will that go over? Will that end? Will, or will social distancing end? That's your first question. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, I think it will end because if once a lot of people are vaccinated, there will be very, very little virus that is around and almost everybody will be safe. And so social distancing will not be necessary anymore. So I think that the social distancing will end uh, relatively soon, probably as soon as the vaccine is rolled out. Um, so I would not worry about that for the future. Thank you so much. Um, George. My other. Oh, you have two questions. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Of course. Um, so, my friend said that coronavirus was a lot like SARS. Is that true? It happened a long time ago. Yeah, that's a very good question, and you're certainly right. Um, so, 
the new coronavirus is also called, called SARS coronavirus 2. And we have a SARS coronavirus uh, that happened in or appeared in 2002, 2003, also in China. And it also came from bats. And it's very, very similar. Um, it's basically like two siblings. It's almost like twins. Okay, what about George? So, uh, is the seasonality of these viruses, um, does it have to do with the virus itself and how it reacts to um, temperature and environment? Or is it more related to um, the way we live? That, uh, you know, in the colder months we're inside, um, uh, are, you know, we're breathing stale or more stale air that is potentially um, more, uh, maybe, you know, a better environment for these, for these viruses. Um, um, so that, yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I, I, I would love to have the answer. And for some time, there were indications and hypotheses that uh, things like temperature and humidity are a big factor. Um, and they might be, and you might also be right that uh, being in winter in crowded spaces um, inside all the time might facilitate the transmission of the virus. Um, but the problem is a little bit that specifically when a new pandemic virus hits, it doesn't seem to care much about the season. Um, and what we also see for a lot of these viruses that, is that they have seasonality in the north, on the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, but they are basically randomly circulating in, uh, in the uh, regions around the equator. For example, Nicaragua usually has two to three waves of influenza every year. Um, while we have a season, right? Here it starts in December, it ends in April. In Nicaragua, there might be a flu uh, epidemic at any point in, during the year. So the honest answer is, there are hypotheses, and some of them have been investigated in animal models, but we don't have the exact answer. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Nurit? Nurit? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, uh, Professor Cromer, I have a question about your cell paper that found that in 40 to 60% of unexposed individuals, uh, there were T cells that were cross-reactive to SARS coronavirus 2. I was wondering if you could comment more on the implications of that um, for herd immunity. And also, um, I wanted to know whether that's been explored more. I mean, it seems like to me, uh, uh, I would wonder, has anyone done any testing on monkeys to see if Common, if inoculating them with common cold coronaviruses provides any protection against SARS coronavirus 2? Um, very good question, a very good suggestion. Uh, so that experiment has not been done. Um, might be an, a very interesting experiment. Um, the important part about that cell paper is if you look at the y-axis, the scale is different. Um, so you find um, D cells which play very important roles in, in protection from, uh, from severe disease for many infections. Uh, you find these cells in people against SARS-CoV-2 in people that haven't seen SARS-CoV-2. But they're about 10 times less than in people who have seen SARS-CoV-2. And the other problem with these cells is that it's usually reactive. So if you have antibodies, the antibodies are already there. The virus gets into your body and is immediately neutralized. Uh, if you have a D cell response, you get infected, you might get sick, and then the D cells kill the infected cells. So it's more reactive and later. Uh, so that might explain why, in some cases, why the virus infections are less severe in some people than in others, but I'm not so sure how much it really contributes to herd immunity. Uh, but you're completely right, we need studies in animal models to look at that and we need larger studies in humans to look into that. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that question. We have time for two more questions. Um, Sadia. 
you want to go? Sure. Hi. Thank you so much, Professor Kramer. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk. Two quick questions. You had mentioned for antibody stability, you've seen it is stable for three months. Have there been studies looking back for a longer period of time? Do you have anything going back for about six months? And the second question is, there's been some news on different variants, the variant from China versus the variant from Europe. Are you seeing a difference between the two variants or is that more of news that doesn't have that much fact behind it? Yeah, so let me ask to answer the first question first. Um, so, you know, we had the first official case in New York City on, uh, what was it, February 29th. Um, and we actually have serum from that person and that's the earliest time point we have, right? So uh, we're following people we probably follow people for will follow people for years, but there is no data for six months just because um, you know we don't have the infections. The the there might be some Chinese groups that have six months data, but I'm not aware of any publications that looked at that yet. Uh, the second question was if there the if the variants make any difference. So there is one variant um, that uh, seems to slowly take over. Um, that has a mutation in the spike protein, which might make the spike protein more uh, more stable and maybe make the virus more infectious, but the effect does not seem to be drastic. Uh, we don't see any differences in terms of um, neutralizability or you know, where you would think that the virus could escape the, the immune response. Uh, we don't see that at all. And actually one of the Chinese vaccine producers, uh, Sinovac, um, they, with the with the serum from the vaccinated animals, they tried to neutralize different viruses, all these variants, and they were all the same. So um, all viruses mutate, right? And this virus mutates very slowly. And right now, there is not really an indication that it would would become more dangerous or that it would escape uh, immune responses so far. But again, we need to keep watching, right? Thank you so much for that. Our last question is from Jeff. Hello, Dr. Kramer. Uh, Jeff Bright from Olympus. Uh, thank you for taking the time. Uh, very interesting work. Um, I do have an interesting question. I'm out here in Denver, and obviously our experience has been much different than uh, the residents of uh, the Northeast. Uh, but an interesting uh, side story that has developed here is that the uh, blood type may have an impact on the impact of the virus to individuals. Um, I, my understanding is that O blood type seems to be less susceptible to the virus than A or B. Can you explain why that is and uh, how we might use that element as a, a way to battle the virus? Thank you. Um, yeah, very, very interesting question. Um, so we don't know why that is yet. Uh, this came out uh, relatively, there were early indications that this might be the, ca the case. There are now CHIVO studies that looked at that. Um, the effect size is not very big. So it makes a difference. It doesn't make a big difference. And uh, so that's kind of why I'm not 100% sure if we actually um, can use that to battle the virus. We don't know what the mechanism behind, behind that is. And even if you would know, you might reduce the chance of, of, uh, of severe disease by 50%, um, which sounds a lot, but might actually not be that much. So th there's further research needed. And again, the mechanism of this is not really understood, but uh, there is data that indicates that blood type might make a difference. All right, so thank you everyone for your questions. Thank you, Flory, for such a wonderful presentation.